very honored to be joined here by Greg Pennyroyal from Wilson Creek Winery. Uh, we've had lots of fun working with Greg with their wine grape production the last few years, and I wanted him to share some of his thoughts and his perspectives. So why don't we begin there, Greg? I'd love to hear your perspective on the work that you've done at the winery the last couple of years, your approach, what you've learned, and what you've observed. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks very much. It's great to uh, be doing another webinar with you, John. So the last time we did one, I think is almost three years ago, about when we started this program. When we started the program, we sort of had no idea how much of an integrated program it really should be. We just started doing some foliars. We obviously did the plant sap analysis, which was just like an epiphany. to get that kind of feedback on a regular basis. But where we fell short is we didn't adjust every foliar based on the plant sap analysis. We sort of just had a kind of a standard program that we followed. We made a few tweaks, but we really didn't follow the program that well. The following fall, oh, I might also add that we started small. We had one block of, uh, what, about four acres? Block nine is about four acres? Four. One block of four acres compared to an identical control block that was two acres. And so we did sort of the full AEA program on that four acres and took a look at the difference. Um, as far as actual yield, there was a marginal yield difference between that. But that has to do with the physiology of the grape. And we'll get to that in a minute. What we did notice, though, is an immediate improvement in the, first of all, the quality of the grapes. Look, we're winemakers, first and foremost. I identify myself as a viticulturist. I tell the crew all the time that we're not growing grapes, we're growing wine. We're making wine here. So the ultimate um, sort of determination of quality is what kind of wine does it make? And even in that first year, we were going into block four, which is our control block, and then we jumped over to block nine. And of course, you know, we're always eating grapes while we're harvesting. It's hard work out there. It's thirsty. You know, eating some of the grapes is uh, a good way to keep going. And when we got to the block nine, I'll never forget, Pedro leans over to me and goes, these don't taste like grapes. These taste like wine. And he was right. <laughs> it had that quality. It had shape. It had approach. It had finish. It tasted like wine. And that's when I knew we were onto something. I knew our systems needed a lot of work, but I knew we were really onto something with this. So that following year, we applied the fall soil program. I'm going to go back a couple years before that. Before we started doing any of this, Pedro and I started working together here about five years ago. Pedro's been here 20 years. Pedro's been here since day one. Um, when I got here, I was studying with Elaine Ingham. I was going to be making compost tea. I love Elaine to pieces. She's just a dear, dear person. But she was like, all you need to do is compost tea. It'll take care of everything. It doesn't. It helps. So the first thing we did is add a lot of compost. I did a sheet composting of about, oh, about 40-something tons of yard waste per acre sheet composted and worked it in. But before that, we actually had a dozer here, and we had really bad compaction. So I took the four tines off the dozer and just left two and did a two, you know, under the wheel ripper. And I figured, well, I'll do it once with a dozer, get a good rip, and then, you know, open things up and then go from there. The ground was so hard that the back end of the dozer was lifted up and often wouldn't settle down. It was running on the front of the tracks. And the, this is a wow. this is a D8 talking. This isn't some little garden tractor. This is a D8 with only two rippers. <laughs> and it's riding up like this. And we're like, and, this, and when the sheets came up, they came up in these large blocks. It looked like almost concrete. We've gone from there to this year. Actually, you and I spoke and we decided another rip under the wheel would probably be pretty good. I'm, I'm pretty much in a no-till system here. But occasionally, I'll do a rip. And you know, I went to a no-till drill this year. We ran it in our 110 horsepower Kubota in third gear. No problem. It just opened it up. <laughs> oh, wow. You know, yeah, I mean, what a difference. We had another funny story. We, we were harvesting, and we had some outside guys come in, and they go, uh, hey, man, what's wrong with your vineyard? You go, what do you mean what's wrong with the vineyard? He goes, the ground is all spongy. What's wrong with it? <laughs> <laughs> 
So well, anyway, so the, the, the program we started that that's, you know, the fall soil application really helped that following year, which would have been last year, we expanded it to most of the home vineyard and a few outside vineyards. We made some adjustments to the foliar. We actually made a lot of adjustments to the foliar based on the sap analysis. We got much better at working the system. That was the big improvement. Part of what we figured out, we had this consistent problem with calcium. And we kept looking at the calcium issue until we figured out our problem wasn't not enough calcium, it was excessive magnesium in the soil. So with that in mind, we, you know, uh, David Miller works very closely with us. By the way, you've got a really good staff. I've worked with a lot of agronomists in my career. Your staff is just first rate. But anyway, we analyzed it. And the big shift we made this year is we're really focusing on that calcium. You know, sort of calcium drives so many things that until we figure that out, and as you have taught all of us, calcium doesn't absorb particularly well through the leaves and it surely doesn't translocate particularly well. You really need to get it through the xylem out of the soil. So we shifted our focus and put a fair amount of gypsum. Uh, we just did a whole foliar program with rejuvenate, and, you know, to get the soil biology going. Fortunately, we're finally getting some rains now, so hopefully it'll rain in. We were quite dry until two weeks ago, but that's the shift we have this year. On block nine and some of our smaller blocks that we had in the second year of the program, that would have been last harvest, 2019 harvest, I consistently saw anywhere between an 18 and 30% increase in yield, a phenomenal increase in quality. You could just tell when you were in one of those blocks. The, the, the leaf looked good, the color was good, the internode spacing was less, um, the ratio of width to height, which is the zinc you know, issue, looked good. I mean, just so many of those parameters looked good. But the part that was amazing is we had vineyards that in the past, well, we had a, a Zinfandel vineyard. It's a what, that's almost 40 years old, that vineyard? Mm -hmm. um, the year before, we only got about a ton and a half to the, to, to the acre. This year, we got three and a half tons to the acre, and the quality is phenomenal. We had a Cinso block that's actually a pretty healthy block. The year before, we got uh, three and a half tons to the acre. This year, we got close to six tons. But that six tons was the best Cinso we've ever harvested. So as winemakers, we're very concerned about yield is not my number one priority. It's quality. But if I can bump my yield up 20, 30%, it more than pays for the program. You know, that's what I'm looking at is as an absolute minimum ROI in yield to pay for the program. But it needs to have commensurate quality. So that's kind of where we're at now. What we're looking forward for the 2020 season is we are spending much more time figuring out exactly what the management system is going to look like, being much more um, organized about when we gather data, how we gather it, when we make decisions. Um, one of the major breakthroughs we made is when we looked at your Critical Points of Influence webinar and we looked back at what we've been doing, we had sort of a major epiphany in that Great physiology is interesting because the um, apical meristematic cells that form the buds for the following year happen right after fruit set of the prior year. So this year is 2020. I'm going to do, we're going to, um, we have early bud break. We're going to have flower set. Then we're going to have pollination. Then we're going to have fruit fill. And then it's going to go back to regenerative. and um, it's going to set the cells for the following year. That's why you often going to go back to reproductive. It. Yes, it shifts back to reproductive. That kind of um, visual you developed is really helpful in us thinking about where the plant is. And it makes us realize that if you want to increase your yield, your plant has to be healthy at that point because it is setting its potential cells at that point. Once it and what's interesting about grapes, it actually sets a primary, primordial, a secondary, and a tritary. We noticed in the blocks that where we had the good nutritional program, 
we had two really nice large clusters. Those were the one that was the um, genetic expression of the primary bud, you know, the primordial bud. The primary one, when it expresses, you get these beautiful clusters, no mildew. I mean, just ripe consistently through a Cabernet is famous for not ripening consistently. These were just consistently ripe. It ripened a little later. I mean, just, it was beautiful. And some of the ones that we weren't having such great results with, you would sometimes get one cluster and a couple of smaller ones. That's a primary, maybe a secondary. And then we went to outside vineyards where they're just really having struggles. Mm -hmm all these little tiny clusters of fruit that's the, the tri um, you know the triary uh, cluster so this is a really important concept as grape growers to have to realize is you have to get the nutritional balance right right after fruit fill to get a good harvest for the following year if there's one thing winemakers need to be is patient <laughs> it takes a long time Greg, to make good wine there are two different points that you made that I would uh, like to understand a little bit better. You mentioned that you observed much better quality and better flavor. Were you measuring that quality? Were you observing any differences in acids or tannin profile, or was that just flavor and mouthfeel? And the second question is you also mentioned observing differences in powdery mildew with the Cabernet right now. Have you observed any differences with disease resistance? Yes. So first on the quality. We don't have the laboratory facilities to do a full quality panel. However, we do measure acid to bricks ratio. And on those blocks, it retained consistently higher acids um, to the bricks ratio. The other thing is, you know, we kind of do a mini bioassay on all of our harvests, and it's called wine making. You, know, you add yeast to something, you have to do a mini bioassay. And consistently on block nine, you just get this beautiful curve of fermentation. When you have um, grapes that have excessive nitrates and don't have um, complex amines, amino acids, um, you know, proteins, you know, um, uh, all the way up to the, the uh, complex nitrogens, you get this spike and a crash. This was called a stalled fermentation. It's really common in winemaking. Once you get the nitrogen, and I am sure the secondary metabolites, the minerals, and I mean the secondary uh, nutrients, the minerals, all that, you get this beautiful slow curve where it just ferments and it ferments really slowly and it just keeps going up until it's dry. And it just runs out of food and there's usually too much alcohol in there too. It just stops. <laughs> that's a natural fermentation. And that's what we saw in those blocks. So the winemaker was really happy with it too. One of our goals is I want my winemaker to only do artistic chemistry, not rescue chemistry. So if he's going to manipulate the wine or whatever, I want him to do it for artistic reasons, not because it has excessive um, nitrates. You have to add yeast auto yeast to it to make it finish fermenting. Um, on the powdery not, mildew, we saw... Well, actually, we saw no powdery mildew in that block now that I think about it. It was... We, we sprayed, we were still using stylet oil. We, we actually sprayed it less and we used stylet oil. We used a couple as a precautionary spray when it was, you know, just high in the Goobler index, you know, the powdery mildew index mm -hmm. compared to other blocks that weren't getting the nutritional treatment. They all had small spots of mildew that we had to drop out. You know, this is another thing that's, you know, when we look at the actual cost, it's expensive to go out and run that many sprays from a nutritional point of view. But when you actually take out the cost of not having to spray for powdery mildew and the cost of the fungicides, it starts to make the equation work a lot better. So we didn't do an actual controlled experiment where we used, you know, where we had a block that wasn't getting anything. But in that block that was in the, the third year and the other block that was in the second year, we saw virtually no powdery mildew. We also saw no detritus later in the season. Mm -hmm. We had one block that was petite Syrah that was very prone to detritus. And we got a tiny bit in that block, but that's because it's on a head train system. And we are converting that to a um, VSP, a vertical shoot position on a wire. It's just, it was a mistake in the layout. It's, no, it's not a good indication. 
Greg, when you say you saw no powder mildew in these blocks, how did that compare with with your other blocks? Uh, was it a, a year with heavy powdery mildew pressure? Not so much. What was the context? It was a modest pressure year, even though in some of the outside vineyards, it actually got pretty heavy powdery mildew because it was cool. So as a comparison, our Chardonnay block had no powdery mildew, zero. And we had an outside vineyard that we lost about 30%. And we were spraying that outside vineyard twice as much as we were spraying our internal vineyard. So it, it makes a difference. Pedro, what have you been observing in terms of managing the vines? Are you observing a different plant structure with uh, different node spacing, buds, so forth? What's, what's going on with, with vine management now that we're managing nutrition a bit differently? What we have, I'm doing everything to, for example, for, for me, the most important for me is pruning. You know, I need the depends what kind of fruit it is. Then we make you the space that exactly the fruit needed. How is protect when when rest right now? Is when you we don't have too much mildew. So that that why the first the first is the pruning. And the second is clean all the soccer. Remove everything the soccer is around the, the the best fruit that we have in the in the, in the cordon. In the branch, that why is the, the other second, what is it? The next step that we clean better or the, the remove all the soccer. And that way, I never have probably about me do right now. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point that Pedro brings up. This is part of an integrated system, it's not just nutrition. You also have to pay attention to your canopy management. And you know, Pedro is the king of canopy management, yeah. he knows how to open up fruit, but where the nutritional program pays off is we're actually, we do more spacing of our, of our shoots and we have more yeah. of an open canopy, but we're producing more fruit per cluster. So our actual yields are going up, right. but our canopy is more open. The other benefit that we question. didn't even, that didn't dawn on us is if you, you know, for all the other vineyard owners out there, you know what a dog Cabernet is to harvest. It's really hard to get in there. Clusters are small. It's just hard to harvest, except for those blocks that had that primary apical meristematic expression, you know, where you get those primary cells. Mm -hmm. It was just two giant clusters, and it's just clip, clip, boom in the bucket, move on, instead of snip, 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 pulling mm -hmm. leaves. And just, yeah, it makes a huge difference. So, so, just, so we compared the cost of machine harvest to hand labor. Hand labor costs about 30% more in a block that has small clusters. With the big clusters, the hand labor actually costs us a couple percent less. It was so easy to harvest. And then we got to hand yeah. harvest it. We don't like machines. Machines beat plants. I'd rather hand harvest. Not to mention, I'd rather pay you know, our crew than pay international harvester or plunk or whoever. You know, We love them, but I, I love my guys better. <laughs> Greg, a question has come through from uh, David Liebman. How was the vigor of the vines with the regenerative protocol compared to other blocks? Did the regenerative protocol significantly increase vigor? Did you, did you see much of a response? That's actually a great question. With our old program where we're using you know, a, a mixture of kind of biologics and, and some of the organics, what we saw was really inconsistent vigor. We would see some vines that would shoot these long, shoots and others that were kind of stunted right. what we've seen with this is much more consistency the inner node spacing is a little bit tighter which we thought would be a challenge because now your fruit is closer to the cordon and both your clusters are a little tighter but we just haven't seen that as a problem in mm -hmm. the past we would have clusters that touch and you immediately get mold we don't see that so much anymore mm -hmm. but anyway what we see is a Overall increase in the number of leaves, but a decreased internode length. And the reason that's such a benefit, especially for a hot climate, is the old VSP system is, you know, you, you put your, your vines up on a wire, and then you put them up on a second wire. The fruit is in the fruit zone, and it kind of looks like this beautiful hedge. Well, now we put them up on the first wire and let about 30% of the vines kind of hang out. And then on the top wire, we let even more hang out. So we have this sort of mixed canopy. The, the fruit is always still in the middle, 
but we have a little more of an umbrella and more of an umbrella on the top. And what that does is it protects the fruit from the intense heat and sun, but still gives us an open canopy. So to specifically answer the question is I am seeing a small increase in vigor as measured by Mm -hmm. the canopy, but more leaves. The inner node spacing is tighter and the leaves are, we're actually getting bigger leaves too, which is, which is interesting. Um, so I would say overall an increase, but consistency is the biggest payback. How has this influenced and affected your irrigation water management? There's a question that has come through from Nicholas. Uh, how does, what does irrigation management look like? Another great question. When we added organic matter to the soil and then we did the fall soil primer program, we have reduced our irrigation from historical norms. So I'm now comparing it to the D8 bulldozer days, right? Mm -hmm. Compared to that, we are watering about 33 to 38% less with a higher yield and less often. Hold the water more often. One thing that's a little bit of a variable is with grapes, when you get hot weather, it really pays. We will, during a hot spell, water every night, short drinks every night to keep the plant hydrated so the plant can recover. Mm -hmm. Um, But we see better results with that. We had uh, the first of our 115 plus degree days happen uh, three years ago. And we've had one every year except last year because it's so bad. But anyway, on the valley wide lost about 30% of the fruit during that heat spell. And we lost what, maybe two, three percent? Yeah, not much, just an occasional cluster here and there. It's interesting what grapes do is they'll pick an individual cluster and import that entire cluster and leave the rest. Grapes are really smart. <laughs> they know how to manage stress <laughs> yeah, really well. <laughs> so overall, we're There's using less water, we're using it more efficiently. I'm not sure how much of that is soil and how much of that is plant, even though the other benefit we've had is our cover crops work every year now too. Even in a dry season like this, first year we planted cover crops and it didn't rain, I got barely two inches of growth. This year we had a similar dry year and I still got almost, what's it, about 14 inches now? Yeah, with very little rain. What does your cover crop program look like? What types of cover crops are you planting and when and how are you managing those? So it's always a fall planting because we're taking advantage of the the seasonal rains. My season here is from November to April. I use a a broad mix. My anchor is is oats. I usually have about 50% oats in the mix. I just really like oats. Um, They are changing the soil ecosystem. We used to get a lot of broadleaf um, weeds with the oats. It's gone to almost all grass. I always throw some legumes, some uh, vetch, uh, cow peas, um, um, bell beans. Um, uh, what else do we have in there? I love medic because it holds out on the heat. So it's been a little bit of a shotgun approach, but as we do it every year, we're kind of tightening that up. And you know, some of it's a cost. The other thing I love about oats is you get a lot of biomass, and they're relatively inexpensive. Actually, in one of your seminars, we learned about the whole oxidative reductive benefits of having oats in the system. And so we were kind of wondering why oats work so well. And then when we were all sitting in the seminar, we looked at each other and go, oh, that's what's going on. Yeah, so that actually leads me to, well, we, we haven't really given an introduction. We've talked about the program and what you've been doing from a very macro perspective, but we haven't really talked about how you're managing nutrition differently. And so I'd like to take a few moments to just offer some thoughts and comments. For those of you who are not familiar with our work at Advancing Eco-Agriculture, we approach plant nutrition and managing plant nutrition with the perspective and the objective that we want to produce high yields and we want to produce functional immune systems and resistance to disease at the same time. We know that all of us have our own immune systems. We don't get the flu just because we're exposed to it. We don't get the cold just because we're exposed to it. And the same is true of plants as well. We know that plants can be exposed to powdery mildew or to xylella or to canker, and they'd respond to it differently. We understand that some varieties are resistant, some are more susceptible. But the question that we should be asking is what are the foundational causes behind that? And we believe 
that the causes of disease and insect susceptibility are a result of nutritional imbalances. And as a result of that belief, we seek to manage and balance plant nutrition a bit differently. Yes, we want the high yields, we want premium quality, and we also want to balance nutrition for disease resistance. So I'm going to do a quick screen share. There are a lot of references which point to diseases being correlated with specific nutritional profiles or specific nutritional imbalances. And I did not do an in-depth exhaustive review of the literature, but I wanted to quickly pull up some references to just give you an example of some of the information that is out there that we can find. Pedro just identified the grapes as Cab Franc. Good call. <laughs> <laughs> Probably from you, I would guess. Yeah, he's he's the master. No, that I don't think that, that might be no, it might be my vineyard. No, it's not my vineyard. There'd be more leaves on it if it was. <laughs> Yeah, we don't leave, we don't leave in that hard. Those clusters yeah. also have a little bit of inconsistency in ripening and size. So the foundational premise is that we believe that diseases, I'm going to use powdery mildew as an example. Powdery mildew is not present because of a lack of applied stylet oil or a lack of fungicide applications or a lack of elemental sulfur, but that they're actually present because of imbalanced nutrition. And so some of the references that I pull up for this, I'll just give you a very quick rundown on powdery mildew specifically. Here's one on foliar applications of phosphate, describing how different phosphorus applications and different forms of phosphorus, specifically potassium phosphate, uh, mono and dipotassium phosphate can influence powdery mildew and can produce a significant crop response and resistance. And this is a specific article on lime sulfur. And of course, we understand the challenges that lime sulfur has. But the question that we should ask ourselves is, what if we didn't consider lime and sulfur, calcium polysulfide, as uh, acting topically, which we know it does, but what would the effect be if the plant had adequate calcium and sulfur within the cell, within the cell membranes? What if we approached it from a nutritional perspective instead of from a fungicidal perspective? We've observed in many crops that when we think about uh, copper applications for bacterial disease control or uh, sulfur applications, that when we actually supply these nutrients as plant nutrients in a nutritional form rather than a fungicidal form, we can actually get the same or much bigger response than we can when we apply it topically to the leaf surface. Here are some additional papers that talked about the impact of sulfur and of copper and manganese uh, with various grapevine diseases. So I wanted to share those. I wasn't actually able to find a screenshot of these articles, but they're in the literature. A lot of them are published in uh, book format, so those are available. Here's one on copper, biological control of several different diseases. Uh, this one was actually not from a fungicidal, but from an internal nutrition perspective. And then we go back to sulfur again. The important, here's actually this paper on the sulfur amino acids of plants as an overview is really a description of the impact that sulfur has internally within the plant instead of applied externally and topically, talking about protein synthesis, the formation of different stop enzymes or stop amino acids to form complete enzymes and complete proteins, and how that contributes to resistance to powdery mildew and to canker and to other diseases. There, I've actually found several very interesting papers on sarsilica. And reporting as much as a 60 to a 70% reduction when we had adequate levels of silica within the plant. And we can actually use this in the growing season with foliar applications of silicon, which are a lot of fun. That's foliar applications of potassium silicate for powdery mildew control are an effective tool, but they are a challenging tool to manage because. Potassium silicate doesn't get along with anything else in the spray tank. Spray tank and the lines have to be absolutely clean, and it must be applied completely by itself. Um, otherwise, you turn the entire tank into glue. So it's an interesting material. The research indicates that it's very effective, but it is a bit challenging to work with. So there's this research on silicon. I actually have another paper that uh, reports something similar. and. If we change the frame, instead of thinking about silicon from a 
perspective of a foliar application of potassium silicate, what happens when we consider the application or the absorption from the root system? So it should actually be possible to have the plant absorb enough silicon from the soil profile to give it this resistance to powder mill. And not should, but we know it's possible because we're able to measure that when we use sap analysis. Greg spoke a little bit about sap analysis and in the context of silicon, there's one comment worth making is we find a direct correlation between the level of microbial activity and silica absorption from the soil. So when you have really active biology, so when your soils changed from uh, D8 bulldozer soil to something that you could rip and have this really active soil biology, that is going to translate to increased silicon absorption in the soil, which is going to give you more resistance to powdery mildew. A 20 minute review of the literature on powdery mildew correlated with specific nutri nutritional profiles reveals that uh, what is in the literature reveals a correlation between imbalances of phosphorus, sulfur, copper, and manganese. That's what I've been able to identify so far, and that was simply with very preliminary research. I think with some deeper digging, we could probably find more correlations. So I wanted to switch gears away from powder mildew. I know that's kind of a major one, but also speak a bit about um, red blotch. Uh, I know the virus infection is a significant problem for some growers in some areas, also xylella. Um, Greg, a few moments ago, you mentioned the implications of redox and oxidized environments versus reduced environments. Uh, the profile for xylella is really interesting, actually. It corresponds directly to a, an oxidized environment within the soil profile. I'm not certain about within the plant, but in order for xylella to really thrive, it really thrives in the presence of nitrate and oxidized manganese. And when we have reduced manganese and ammonium nutrition instead of nitrate nutrition, um, xylella infections drop off significantly, very significantly. In the book, Mineral Nutrition and Plant Disease, there's this one sentence, this one paragraph that really caught my attention. It took some time to dig up the reference, but it says, molybdenum, like other heavy metals, deactivates viruses by denaturing their protein coat. And in this, molybdenum appears to be a particularly effective metal or metalloid. That really caught my attention because we have worked with different crops over the years, seed potatoes in particular, where we apply generous amounts of molybdenum, and we tested and knew for certain that the planted seed was infected with a certain percentage of viral DNA, and the harvested crop contained no virus infections. So something shut it off. Something shut it down possibly molybdenum. So I actually took some time for me to find the paper, but I was able to find a copy of this paper just a few days ago. And the paper reported that uh, applications of sodium molybdate, they did this research with uh, tobacco mosaic virus as well as other viruses, and they reported as much as a 90% inhibition of viral DNA when molybdenum was applied as a foliar spray or applied it to the plant leaf surface. So I find that to be pretty remarkable. So I wanted to share these examples as an overview to say that the research exists in the literature to describe disease susceptibility or resistance correlated with specific nutritional profiles and that when we manage nutrition differently, it's possible to greatly reduce the presence or the impact of powdery mildew or uh, red blotch or canker or whatever the case might be, which going back to you, Greg, is exactly what you were describing that you observed and experienced with powdery mildew pressure. Yeah, John, I got to tell you an interesting story on that. We were at the Sustainable Ag Conference up at San Luis Obispo this year. Mm -hmm. At the end of every presentation where they were looking at either varietal or uh, cultivation practices to lessen the spread of powdery mildew, <coughs> uh, fungal pathogens like you type up or um, you know viral infections like XF. Mm -hmm. We would ask, "Did you do plant sap analysis?" And every single one of them said no. Until we got to the professor uh, from South Africa, who was looking at fungal canker diseases, and he said, "Yes, 
we do plant sap analysis because we have to find the sickest vines. They're the only ones that will get the fungus. That's what they're using <laughs> plant sap analysis for. And we're like hitting ourselves in the forehead going, are you crazy? Don't you see the correlation here? But they don't. <laughs> I'm glad you, you brought this up. This is actually something I, I really wanted to mention to the, this group is we've taken some time to get to that point. I think we are at the very beginning of that second level of the plant health pyramid. We're probably running at maybe 35, 40% photosynthetic efficiency. I think we now know what we need to do as far as putting a system together to get us up to that next level. Once we can do this, the universities are incredibly interested in doing some research with this. They just have no clue how to approach it. And so it behooves us who are in the field, really on the cutting edge, to work with the universities, get some research behind this, and guide them towards nutritionally based research. Um, at the University of California, Riverside, I'm fortunate to work with Philippe Rothschild, I think is his last name. He discovered that there were plants in Temecula that did not get Pierce's disease, that's a little fluosa. And he, they couldn't figure out the correlation until he realized that every single one of these plants had a very specific microbiome connection. They all had this, a similar microbiome that had certain bacteria and certain fungi species in there. And they correlated that with the ability of those vineyards to not get XF and everything around them was getting it. The second they sprayed Roundup, they lost it. We are planning on doing a couple of you know, test studies and if there are other vineyard owners out there that would like to, you know, kind of join us in this research, I'd love to hear from them because I'd love to have a couple of test plots throughout the state, especially places like up in Napa where there's currently xylophidios, you know, Pierce's is, is really exploding up there. Thanks for sharing those thoughts, Greg. We have a number of questions that have come through. First question, curious to know if the open canopy is helping with late season moisture from light rains or fog drying up to minimize mold formation on the fruit. Absolutely. It does a number of things. We get so much sunlight now, we really don't have to worry about getting sun into the canopy anymore. So we don't leave. That's the other thing. If you do proper pruning and proper suckering that Pedro was talking about before, you don't have to leaf thin later in the season and you don't have to drop fruit. Next question. Do you use liquid seaweed or kelp in your foliar spray program? Do you apply this before or after bloom? Any observed or known improvements? Um, it is part of every AEA mix we have. So the answer is yes. <laughs> All the time. And I have, you know, we, we have a small growers group. I, we have a lot of small growers here. So once a month I get together with them and I'm eventually trying to work it out so they can use these products. But some of them are just using regular seaweed and kelp, um, mostly Acadian, I think is the brand they sell here. And you see tremendous results. It's immediate, it's obvious, and it's really strong and pretty much at all phases, but especially at fruit set and fruit fill. A question here from Andrew Johnson on uh, going back to your cover crops. Uh, how do you manage your cover crops at the end of the life cycle? Are, do you leave them standing? Are you mowing them down, windrowing them? What's happening? I currently mow them because I'm after the mulch effect. If I had a crimper, I'd crimp it. But uh, right now, I am just using them as a mulch. I just mow them down. How frequently are you using sap analysis? Earlier in the conversation, you mentioned that you want to be a bit more efficient with sap analysis. How are you doing it now, and how are you hoping to do it in the future? Great question. We do it every two weeks. We tried last year adjusting it a little bit to physiological cycles, and it just having those two week intervals just works out better. The, one of the epiphanies that we had last year is I was defining my old leaf as the leaf opposite the fruit because it usually is your, your, full, your fully developed um, uh, best old leaf on the bottom. The problem with that is we were seeing kind of odd, we weren't seeing those classic movements of nutrients from the old leaf to the new leaf. And what's dawned on us is we think that the leaf opposite the fruit isn't a good example for old leaf. It's a good example for opposite the fruit leaf, that the old leaf is actually the one below that. So last year, we, we uh, 
did every other week on nine blocks, I think, nine or 10. Um, this year, I'm cutting the numbers down because I have a sense of how consistent they are. So I can use certain blocks as my indicator blocks, and I know the rest are going to be pretty similar. But what I am doing is on three out of uh, the six blocks, I'm adding that, uh, we're adding another variable. We're adding that leaf below the fruit leaf, the fruit leaf, and then the upper leaf. And if that shows us different data, we might just modify that. Because it's what's really interesting is we'll now have three data points. What's moving from the old? What's moving to the young? What's moving to the fruit? That might give us some real insights. How long are you continuing your sap analysis in the season? Are you going all the way through until harvest? Or are you going after harvest? I generally like to do one after harvest, and then I do one additional one, what I'm guessing is about a month before senescence, because we're doing fall foliar sprays, and I want to make sure that we are adjusting on that. To be honest, I'd probably like to do one more just before senescence to kind of see what it's going to bed with, but we haven't done that, so I think I'll do that this year. Okay. You, you got to really mention on these tap stuff. analysis, once you start doing them, they're totally addictive. You start to see these trends and you start to see this stuff and, you know, we'll have it on the screen and it's like we're flipping back and forth and going, oh man, look at this trend, look at this trend. The other thing I'll mention about the trends that we're going to start looking at is instead of using a consistent baseline, we are going to experiment with saying, okay, at the different critical points of influence, should there be higher or lower levels of things and doing sort of a second analysis saying during this phase, shouldn't we really be up here? And if we are, what results did we see? You know, Greg, I find it really interesting that um, I'm, of course, a big advocate of SAP analysis. And uh, routinely, in response to the blog, I get emails and messages on social media all the time with people commenting that, um, well, we can't justify the cost of doing SAP analysis. We can't afford to do it that often. We only want to do two or three per year. And I can tell who those people are. Those are people who've never used SAP analysis. It's really very yes. simple. They haven't done it because when you actually see the quality and the integrity of the data and how valuable and helpful it is, you quickly realize that you can't afford not to use SAP analysis that consistently. And in the few cases where growers have indicated that, oh, SAP analysis is unproven technology or it hasn't been proven yet, those were the growers who tried to use it only a few times per year. You really need the entire you need to use it as a system so you can observe the trends. The trends are remarkable, which is why we're going back to that every other week. It's remarkable what you can see with it. Greg, there's a few questions here that you're really going to like. Can you please speak to water management practices? I'm assuming that AEA encourages more consistent moisture for vines as opposed to the historic dogmatic approach of them needing to suffer near drop conditions for great quality. Okay, so even before AEA, when I was learning from Pedro, he says, you know this deficit irrigation stuff? It's kind of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and we have more or less followed that. He taught me that even beforehand. The actual system, I have soil sensors. I have a two-foot, a three-foot, and occasionally a four-foot soil sensor. A one-foot, two-foot, three-foot, and occasionally a two, four-foot soil sensor. I do pressure bombs bi-weekly in the summer. I use Simis, you know, so we're doing evapotranspiration. But ultimately, what we look at is just what do the vines look like? Mm -hmm. Is there moisture available? What do the tendrils look like? And the pressure bomb is actually my best tool because it's actually telling you how much stress the plant specifically is under. But to that end, we never actually stress the plants. This whole thing of deficit irrigation I just haven't seen the results. Plants that aren't healthy will produce higher levels of phenolics and certain secondary metabolites under stress. Healthy plants produce them anyway, and they produce more the less you stress them. I think that whole deficit irrigation thing happened because everybody's functioning on that first tier of the plant health pyramid. Once you move up, that's no longer a really viable concept and there's some studies, I'll, I'll send you a link to a really interesting study that was done out in Washington about not doing deficit irrigation. And fortunately, 
you know, it's in the um, Horse Haven Hills area, I believe, which just naturally has really good volcanic soils. So they, um, they showed that deficit irrigation does not improve grape quality or wine quality. I think it's really interesting, the, and you answered the question exactly the same way that I would have, Greg, in that it depends on where you are with plant health. And as you move up on the plant health pyramid, healthier plants actually produce more of these phenolic and aromatic compounds naturally, just as a result of their level of health. And I know that it's a different plant, and I know that it's not quite the same, but we're still talking about production of terpenoids and phenolic compounds, aromatic compounds, so forth. Um, I challenge anyone to try to persuade a cannabis grower to do deficit yes. irrigation on a cannabis crop. <laughs> yes. They do yeah. everything possible to keep an optimal environment. Yes. Uh, another question that is here is, how was your summer weed pressure under your drip lines? We have been surprised to find that our weed pressure is actually reduced. Could this be from the microbials in the drip, ir drip irrigation application? What have you observed? I would agree with that. So we have gone from having a mix of uh, woody and broadleaf weeds to have most grasses that are generally pretty easy to maintain. I own a Clemens radius, which is a under the row cultivator. Mm -hmm. So we'll cultivate it down once or twice. But as long as you don't have large weeds growing up into the canopy, I kind of don't get this obsession with having to have the underside mm -hmm of the canopy perfectly clean. As long as it's under control, it's fine. If you have grown, the whole idea of plants stealing water and nutrients from vines, I think is a total misnomer. First of all, they're in a different, you know, they're perennials, they're deep. It's a whole different, you know, um, biological level. Um, with that cultivation, we're now seeing it's easy to cultivate. Yeah, so we're seeing a big improvement in that. And the other thing that I just don't worry about it that much, even in the mid row, I'll mow maybe twice a year, you know, once when it's tall and then once just before harvest, just to kind of clean things up and make sure it's safe. Um, it's kind of the same with gophers. I'm really aggressive with gophers on my young plants because they do damage. But on the old plants, I don't see them doing any damage, and all they're doing is opening up the soil and tilling it for me. So just I put up some owl boxes and leave them alone. <laughs> I suspect you have lower gopher populations than a few of the growers that we work with. That's probably, that might be true. That being said, I am a real advocate of owl boxes. I did a labor cost savings and each one of my owl boxes saves me about $2,400 to $2,800 per year per box. In labor savings. Wow. Yeah. They're a great wow. investment. And they're fun to watch. <laughs> They keep us company all night. We still have spray, right? Yeah, they're, they become our friends. <laughs> we still have a few really good questions here. There's one from Nicholas. Uh, can you touch briefly on uh, Utypa? Utypa dieback is a, oh, it's, it's a fungal disease, and it's transmitted through sporulation, usually during the pruning period. So the current best remedy, I and mean, once a plant gets Utypa, you can sometimes cut it back because it starts from the extremities, works down the cordon, and then works towards the side. Um, if you catch it, you can cut it back, and the new growth won't have it. Sanitation is really important. We have actually found that a 10% solution of pine salt that you just spray on the clippers and keep them clean really helps to keep transferring it from one vine to the other. That being said, we are 100% convinced that if we can get our plants up to those top tiers of the photosynthetic efficiency that we can cure, not just stop, we can cure Utypa, Red Blotch, and Pierces. <laughs> wow. I can't say just, that, Greg. <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> well, no, what I mean is, uh, what I meant is I believe that to be true, but I can't legally say that. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, well, I can. And actually, I mean, that's why I'm interested in reaching out and trying to coordinate the research. The other thing is, you know, David and I are looking at sort of developing, taking the experience that we've had and developing kind of a package for grape growers. And then what I'd love to do is be able to share each other's data is saying, here's the SAP analysis we're seeing. Here's the conclusions we came to and here's what we did. What do you see? What are you guys doing? And share information. It's one of the things I love about being in the wine community is we share is where really we help each other out a lot. I think that's true of farmers in general, but you know we get together and drink too, so that helps. 
<laughs> Probably helps a lot. Yeah. Uh, there's a question on the programs. In in addition to the cover crops and everything else that Greg is doing, uh, an integrated AEA program really involves continuous applications in the irrigation system whenever we are irrigating with microbial stimulants that include fish and seaweed and humic substances and lots of other goodies and enzymes and the regular routine foliars. So foliar applications are happening all season long, yeah. as long as we have green leaves on the plant until we're approaching senescence, essentially. Greg, can you describe a little bit how you are managing your foliar applications? There's a question here. Can you explain your foliar delivery systems? Are you using tractor-mounted sprayers or fixed lines, back, backpack sprayers? What are you doing and what is the most efficient for you? So at 170 acres, it's obviously highly mechanized. We are using Venturi sprayers. On some of the small blocks, we'll occasionally use those little backpack sprayers. The one challenge I have here is we have hard water and we have water that has chloramines in it. And that is one of my big challenges for this year is we are looking at either water structuring devices or reverse osmosis. And uh, that's kind of project number one this year that uh, hopefully we can follow through in the things that we just uh, had to close the winery down for 30 to 60 days. This might be a challenging year for that one. I might need to push it forward. But from a foliar perspective, the air blast sprayers work really good because they create pretty good mist. The other thing I like about the air blast sprayers is everyone's trying to save how many gallons of water they put out. I would rather put out more and make sure it's good coverage and stays wet. And we only spray at night. That's the other thing. I never spray during the day. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so important to have owl friends out there. They keep your company all night. <laughs> Greg, do you keep any precautions in mind for using microbial sprays uh, close to harvest? And con are you concerned about any impact on yeast populations utilizing the winery for fermentation? No, actually what we have found, I mean, uh, we wind up spraying less the closer we get to harvest because the hopefully the you know, once you get past lag phase and you're well into veraison, you're kind of, you're either there or you're not. You really want to focus most of your foliar sprays earlier in the season and get the nutritional density up. Um, after that, I wind up, when I get close to harvest, I'm usually a couple weeks out before we harvest anyway. What I've actually seen is a increase in the native population of yeasts. When you're making wine, the commercial yeast, you get this spike of, um, of fermentation from the commercial yeast. But at the end, the really difficult to ferment material is usually the native yeast. The native yeast comes in right at the end and winds up kind of being the mop-up crew. And the winemaker has said that consistently, he sees this really nice finish. And the way you can tell with native yeast, because you get this interesting kind of earthy quality that comes to the wine, which of course makes better wine. Greg, have you considered doing any mulching underneath the row? I just spent $48,000 on a kick-ass mulcher, yes. <laughs> we are going to be mulching like crazy. We love mulch, especially in these hot weather. Uh, mm. We had an interesting kind of experiment. We got some mulch, and we mulched most of the vineyard, um, but it was recycled curbside waste. And so it was attracting flies. It was, it was a little bit of a problem. It wasn't great quality. So we had to keep it away from the restaurant. So the block we have that's near the restaurant didn't get mulch. In the heat of the summer, we went out on a day, it was about 110 degrees. I think that day we went out. And I have an infrared uh, thermometer. I kicked back the mulch and checked the soil, and it was a comfortable 86 degrees. I went to where we had bare soil by the restaurant. And even though the, the air temperature was 110, it was 146 degrees because the sun was yep. beating down on it. Everything, the, and biology. First, it's dead. You cooked, we cooked it. And down to a depth of several inches. Biology can only survive at yes. less than 110. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. There's a question from someone who joined a few minutes late uh, asking if you can repeat the yields, that yield increases that you were describing on some of the blocks. And what were the what were some of the numbers that you saw improvements in terms of yield response and sugar content, acidity, and so forth? Sure. So it varies quite a bit depending on whether it's an older block, what the yield was before, you know, et cetera. But as a general percentage, I am seeing a year-on-year -year 
increase in yield of somewhere is between about 18 and 25 percent, pretty much across the whole system. You know, some are quite a bit higher. I've had some blocks that are consistently producing double, and some of my old blocks that just weren't producing well, which are now producing, you know, at a higher level. There's this sort of magic number in, in wine rate production, uh, three and a half tons of the acre, maybe 3.8 acres is kind of the magic number of quality. That's generally in high production areas. In previous years, we were averaging, what, about three tons of the acre, 3.1? Yeah, just barely over yeah. three. We're now consistently producing at least 3.6, 3.8, and some varieties like Sinso are producing six tons, really high quality. Muscat, five and a half tons, really high quality. The Cabernet, which used to be a really weak producer, is producing really well. So it depends on a lot of variables. But when I actually look at the economics, when I look at the inputs of what I'm putting through in the whole vineyard and what my net yield is, I generally calculate about a 20% increase in actual yield. Oh, and the acids. I'm consistently seeing a better acid to sugar ratio. One of the problems we have with heat is to get things physiologically ripe, you wind up bringing in wines that have really low acids. So um, we're seeing a much higher ratio of acids to bricks. I'm getting grapes out here at physiological maturity are often 23 and a half to about 24, 20, even sometimes 25 grapes. But we're seeing the acid retain on it. The other thing is the phenolics aren't burning out. You can tell as you're doing that initial extraction, when you do that first pressing, if you're getting an anthocyanidin blue, the, in other words, the, the color of the phenolics are more on that blue scale, it's been oxidized. But when you get this really nice, complex resveratrol, anthocyanidin, you know, all those, you just get a better quality of color and you can see it. And you, you see that when they do a, a color metrics on it. One of the questions that no one has asked, but I think is probably important is, are you managing cluster pruning differently? So we talk about increasing yield, but when you consider that plant health is increasing or increasing photosynthesis, it would seem to me that as photosynthetic efficiency increases, each plant is going to have more sugar production and you can actually produce the high quality grapes that you're looking for at a higher cluster count and weight per plant. Have you started managing clusters, uh, cluster pruning and thinning differently at all? Yes. Wh whoever asked that question, boy, that is really a great question. Yes, we have. And what Pedro has done this year is on some of our blocks, we generally do, when you're cutting back, you cut back the two buds. Each one of those buds shends out a shoot and each one of those shoots gets two clusters. Mm -hmm. So it's usually two, 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 two along the cordon. Mm -hmm. He's now picking out those healthy ones going two, two, three, two, 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 three, two, two. And we're allowing six clusters of fruit um, on each one of the arms versus the four clusters of fruit as a way of bringing up our production. So, yes, we are very specifically managing that as we see. We tried that five years ago on Movedra. Yeah. And it didn't work that good. The, what wound up happening is the plant couldn't handle it. So the spurs for the following year from those shoots that we had six clusters could barely handle one cluster the following year. It just wouldn't replicate. Pedro has noticed, that's the great part about working so close with Pedro. He's out there every day. And he, he knows those vines like he knows his kids. And he knows, go, this one's doing good. We can do an extra. And they're making those decisions kind of on the fly, just as they go through, yeah. go, I think we can push more here. Let's do it. Yeah. There's a follow-up question here from Don. Hi, Don. Can you also speak to profitability? Is it increasing the same at the same rate as your yields, or are your regenerative input costs less than conventional? That's a great question. So here's what I've seen from a profitability perspective. On the first year, you have a fair amount of inputs, but without a lot of yield increase. And the the quality goes up. So if you are, you know, we make our, we make wine out of our grapes. So theoretically, we're getting a higher bottle price for it. So with that factor, I am probably at the very least recouping my first year's costs. The second year, 
the plants are healthier and those apical buds are now going to produce more fruit for that second year. So where you actually make a profit is in the second year, which is why on the first year, I would actually be a little bit more cautious about input costs and try and target, get the most bang for your buck. You know, talk with the, the consultant as to what they think best return on investment on that first year. And quite frankly, it's, it's the fall fertilization. I mean, that's where you're going to get your most leverage. Um, I am projecting out on the third year, I think I am actually going to be producing more fruit at a lower cost per ton because I'm using less fungicides, a lot less inputs. And my projection for the future is that I will be the high yield, high quality, low cost producer in the valley. <laughs> that's pretty incredible. Yes, that, that's our plan <laughs> for taking over the world. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a lot of fun. Um, yeah. A question here from Stephen Thompson. Can you offer any suggestions or thoughts about combining the AEA program with a biodynamic certification? And how can we integrate this leading edge practice when certification programs are still catching up? I don't specifically do biodynamics, so I'm probably not a good one to answer that from a philosophical kind of Steiner perspective. My take on Steiner has always been that if he had quantum chemistry at his fingertips, he would have described things more like that. I think he was way ahead of his time conceptually but really didn't have the science to kind of keep up with it. And I feel like that's what we're doing is we're marrying the science to this whole thing about being willing to look at energetics and agriculture, being willing to look at things like transmutation of minerals in the soil, you know, things that as a scientist, I was always told that if I even think those things, I'll be hit by a bolt of lightning and ruin my title as a scientist. And, you know, that's, so the philosophical point I think is, is similar. As far as certification, I don't have an answer for that. you have thoughts on that, John? I don't. I'm not familiar enough with a Demeter certification to, to know for certain. I don't know. One last question that has come through. The question is a good one. It seems like you're having a lot of fun growing with regenerative agriculture practices. Are you enjoying yourself more these days? Is farming fun again? I am having a ton of fun. Whoops. I'm having technical issues, too. <laughs> yes, we're having a lot more fun. This has really brought the fun back to winemaking. Um, here's the other part that's super cool. We had a couple of guys come over to our crew from competing vineyards because guys are getting leukemia and people are getting sick. I mean, you know, not to throw water on the having fun thing, but there's a flip side to this, is when you use the chemicals, we had a couple of guys that we've gotten who said their wives made them come over. They said, we don't want you to get sick. Go work with Pedro at Wilson Creek. They don't use chemicals. These guys are healthy. So at the end of the day, that's what really makes us happy, is that we can you know, provide good quality grapes. You know, I also believe in the whole microbiome thing, that if we can establish a healthy microbiome, I think that transfers through the winemaking process into the people who drink it. So not only are people having an enjoyable time not only having a great, um, you know, olfactory and, and taste sensation and, you know, all the benefits of drinking wine, I think that there is a microbiome transfer of health and balance and immune um, resistance and all that, that I can, tr if I can get my vineyard to function on that level, I'm hoping to transfer that to the people that drink wine. Yeah. We're speaking about growing food and growing wine as a okay. contribution to public health. That's really what it is. Okay. Greg and Pedro, I want to say thank you very much for sharing your wisdom, your insights, your experience. And um, if for, for all of our listeners, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to send those to us by email, and we'll be happy to follow up and answer them as well as we can. You are very welcome. Uh, and John, we are still a winery, so it <laughs> wouldn't be a winery if we didn't toast everyone's good health, prosperity, <laughs> And we'll all get <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Mine was dihydrogen monoxide. <laughs> Mine was phenolic complex. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>
Mm-hmm. Have a wonderful day. Thanks. Bye. You too. You too.